Vicente Emanuele. I'm a statistician working as a volunteer for the Statistics Without Borders. I'll be talking to you about the statistical computing models. And I'll be talking to you about logistic regression, multinomial regression, and so on. And you saw previously all the theory behind those algorithms. So the point of this module is to uh, tell you, is to teach you how to actually apply that uh, in real life. So you have a problem, you decide that you need to solve that problem using a logistic regression. How do I actually do that? Let's start. Uh, I'll be using uh, this example here called surviving third degree birds. And this example can be found at Fan, Heckman and Wendt from 1995. This data set refers to 435 people that were treated for third degree burns. And those patients, they were grouped uh, according to the area of the burn on their bodies. And the table here, we can see that the first column it represents the area of the burn. It is in logarithm. I'm just going to call area for now. And uh, we can see here that we have, for example, 1.35, 1.6, 1.75. We have uh, nine groups here. The second column is the number of people that suffered uh, that burn. So the number of people in each group. We can see here that for the first group, we had 13 people, the second one, 19. Uh, the third column represents the number of people that survived their burns. So we have that for the first be the first group, everybody survived their, their uh, burns. So that means that the fourth column that represents the number of people that died in that group is zero. But for this last group here, that is the largest area. We had that 13 people had that uh, burn, but only one of them survived. Sorry. So that means that the mean, that is the last column here on our table, for the first group, as everybody survived, 13 over 13 is 1. But the last, uh, for the last group, where only one person survived, we have that 1 over 13 is approximately 0 0.08. That's what you can see on the table. So if we want to predict the number of people that uh, survived, so if we want to predict actually the mean, the survival rate, based on the area, how would we do that? So the first thing that we should do is to plot that data. So as we're interested on the mean, our uh, area this is ex exactly what I'm plotting. And to plot that in R, I'm going to make use of two libraries. So the ggplot2 and gplur. And they are all part of what we call the diverse universe of libraries. They are particularly uh, libraries created by the same person. And they help you manipulate the data on an easier way. So the ggplot2 library is the library for plotting. And the Dippler library is the library for data manipulation. So you can see here that I'm using this symbol here. This is called a pipe. Pipe is a part of another library in R called Magritte R. But as it's a dependency of the Dippler, once you call that library, you have the pipe as well. So the point of the pipe is that you can apply something. So I'm getting here the data, the table that I showed you before, and I'm applying something to it. I'm applying the plot. So what I'm doing is I'm calling the ggplot function that's going to create the blank canvas for me to actually plot something. I also use this other function here called s that's from aesthetics, and I need to pass to that function my axis. So the x-axis is the area of the burn, and the y-axis is the mean. And then I need to say, what do I need to do with that canvas? So I pass the x and the y, but I didn't tell ggplot what kind of chart I want. And that's what I do once I add the plus. So I'm saying, okay, 
Now that I have the black canvas, I want to add something. So plus, I want to do a simple scatter plot here. So I'm going to use the geom point function because that function is the one that represents the scatter plot. And I'm adding another thing on my chart. So I'm adding this theme BW that represents black and white. Because if you don't add that, the background of your image is going to be gray. And it's my preference to have this white background because I think it's easier to see the data. So that's why I added this theme. And the good thing about this library is that you can plot the chart wherever you want. You can change colors, you can change the size, you can change the shades. If you don't want points, you want stars, you can do everything using this library ggplot2. Okay, but going back to our problem that we want to predict the uh, survival, so the mean, using the area by plotting this scatter plot, we can see that there is a curved relationship between our variables, between area and mean. And it's not a linear relationship. So if at first I thought mm, maybe I could apply a linear regression, I can't because it's clearly not linear. It's clearly my, uh, my response. It's clearly not normal. And we can see here that it kind of looks like an S shape. So if it's not linear, it looks like an S shape. We could probably use a logistic regression. The logistic model you saw before the theory. Let's recap a little bit. In any regression problem, we're interested in the mean value of our outcome variables, our response variable, given the value of the independent variables. In our case, the outcome is the mean, so the survival rate, and the independent variable is the area of the burn. And we refer that as it is uh, given the value of the outcome, we refer to that as a conditional mean. And that's what we say here. This is the uh, expected value of y, so our outcome giving x, given our independent variable. And we can remember that in linear regression, this conditional mean, it can be anywhere in the real number. So it can be anywhere from minus infinity to infinity. But in logistic regression, we are bounded by 0 and 1. And we can define a general linear model, a generalized linear model, as this little function here that involves, uh, that will give us that S shape. And this pi of x, it represents our probability of success, that in our case is the survival of the third degree burns. So uh, the properties of the model, just recapping a little bit more, is that the probability of failure is going to be 1 minus the probability of success. And the odds of success is going to be given by pi of x over 1 minus pi of x. And when you uh, play around with the numbers here, you're going to say that it's just the top part here of the probability of success. So uh, we know about the coefficients we have here in our data. So the beta 0 is going to represent the intercept, and the beta 1 is going to represent how much we're going to vary something by the independent variable. So what is the impact of the size of the burn as the burn increases? That's the x value. So the first thing we need to figure it out is how do I estimate who my beta 0 and my beta 1 are? So to estimate the coefficients, we have two ways. We can use a uh, maximum likelihood to estimate beta. And the good thing is that it's going to be unbiased. We can also estimate the standard errors. And those estimates are going to have very low variability which is good. Uh, so, so now we could be asking ourselves, okay, I know how to estimate the coefficients, 
by hand, for example, I know what a maximum likelihood is. But then, how do I apply that in R? How do I actually fit a logistic regression in R? And for that, we are going to use the GLM function. And that function is from base R, so we don't need to install anything beforehand. And it has three main algorithms, uh, arguments. The formula, that is the model that we are going to fit. The data, that is the data set we are going to use. And the family, where the family for the logistic regression is probably the most important argument. In here, you need to pass the link function. And for logistic regression, the link function is binomial. So if we see here how to actually fit that using our example, our third degree uh, Burns example, you can see here that I'm calling our logistic regression as LR fits that represents logistic regression fits. Uh, this symbol here is just the uh, how you assign variables in R. And you, I'm using the GLM function that I mentioned. So the, uh, the, the formula of the fitting is going to be just the survived, so the number of people that survived. And then you put this, uh, this uh, accent here that is just going to say, OK, this, is, this just what comes before this accent are, is the response variable. And what comes after, it represents the independent variables. In our case, the independent variable is just the area. That's all I'm going to use to try to predict the, how many people survived. The data I'm using is the burns, so it says here third degree burns. And most importantly, the family, family binomial. Uh, I'm just going to output a tidy version of that, because once you run that in R, you're going to have a gigantic outcome. And just for simplicity, as we're interested just in the values of the uh, of the betas and their errors, you can use this function tidy from the broom library, and it's just going to give you a tidy output. And the output here, we can see that it's a table or a table, that it's also a part of the tidyverse uh, kind uh, of libraries. And this broom is also a tidyverse library. And we have the intercepts, that it's our beta zero. And we can see that the estimate is 22.4. And the log area is minus 10.5. So our, uh, our formula, our P formula, P of X, is going to be just 22.4 minus 10.5 times the logarithm of the area. And that's how we're going to get the probability of survive, the mean of survive. So now that we got the values of the coefficients by using the GLM function, what we should do is to actually test for the significance of the coefficients. Because it might be that those, co those coefficients are not statistically significant, so they shouldn't be in the model. Uh, but we need to test, and uh, that's going to involve statistical hypothesis. So what we are actually uh, testing is, does the model is going to include the variable in question or not? So the actual test is going to be, for example, my no hypothesis is beta 1 is equal to 0. So it's not important, it's not relevant versus the alternative hypothesis that is beta 1 is different than 0. So beta 1 is actually relevant to help me uh, predict my, my, survi my survival rate of the burns. Uh, and to answer that, we can use two tests. Uh, one of them is called likelihood a ratio test, and the other one is called Waltz test. So uh, the first one that I'm going to show you is the Waltz test. So the this is the statistics we need to calculate. So you can see that it's the B1 hat, so the estimate of B1, divided by the standard error of our B1 hat. So divided by the standard error of our estimated uh, value. 
So the B the beta one is minus ten point five here. It's just uh, and the standard error that is the same output from before is comes in the second column here, STD error. And we can see that here that the standard error for beta one is one point zero seven. And when we do this division, we have that the result is minus nine point eighty six. 86 that it's exactly the value of the statistic column so you don't need to actually do this calculation because when you run uh, this uh, the the tidy of that LR fit that's the same uh, variable that I'm displaying here the same table that I'm displaying here it already gives you everything you need to say if the variable is important for the model or not. And then the p-value here is super small, it's way less than our standard 5%. So we can reject the null hypothesis, that is, that beta 1 is 0. So by rejecting that, we say that beta 1 is different than 0. So beta 1 is actually important for our model, and we can keep it. The other way of calculating if the coefficient is important is by using the likely root ratio test. So I'm going to show you here how to do that in R. It's not as easy as the wall test that already comes to you as the output of the linear uh, of the logistic model. So we are going to need to use another function for that. This is the statistics here that we're actually testing for. And what this represents is the likelihood of the first model divided by the likelihood of the second model. And one uh, where one of the models is more restrictive than the other one. So, for example, one of the models is going to contain beta 1 and the other one won't contain. So, for that, uh, we need to actually calculate it by using this function here that also belongs to base R that it's called drop 1. And we need to say that the test is a key chi-square test. So drop one, LR fit, that is our linear regression fit. The test is the chi-square. And then here I'm just giving you the tidy uh, output, just like I gave you before for the uh, general logistic regression fit. And we can see here that, oops, that the p-value is super small again, so the conclusion is the same for both tests, because you're also rejecting the null hypothesis here. So for, in both tests, we can say that beta 1 should stay in our model. So now that we calculated uh, to the coefficients and we tested if the coefficients are relevant or not, some other thing that we could also check is the confidence interval for the coefficient. So what is the likely range that our coefficient actually is? So to do that, first using the Walt test, this is the standard way of calculating the confidence interval using 95%. So this is what the 95 represents, the 1.95. So this is all, um, the, the formula is going to be the estimate of beta 1, so it's the beta 1 hat, plus or less or 1.96, that represents a 95% confidence, times the standard error of beta 1 hat. So we have everything on the output of our logistic regression for wall tests, so minus 10.5, plus or less the 1.96 times 1.07 or 067. That's going to be, you just do that calculation. So it's from minus 11.6 to minus 9.5. And that is the likely interval of our coefficient. So we can do the same for the uh, likelihood ratio test. For that one, as we use the function, the drop one function to, count, to actually test the hypothesis, we also need to use another function from base R. So again, we don't need to install anything. 
and that function is confinct that represents confidence interval and then we put the actual fit that is our logistic regression fit and here is the result so you have here that it's from minus 12.7 to minus 8.5 and you can also give here as one of the arguments of the function the confidence you want so the standard here is five percent but you can also give i don't know 99 percent nine percent uh, whatever you need for your analysis and it's gonna give you that confidence so it's not fixed on 95 percent so we saw two ways of calculating the coefficients likelihood ratio and volt but then we could ask ourselves, which one should I use? So all the tests are going to answer to the same question. And the question is, does constraining parameters to zero, and that means if I leave out that predictor variable, does that reduce the fit of the model? That is our basic question. And the so the question is the same, the difference between the tests, how they answer that question. So uh, the likelihood ratio test is going to estimate both models that we want to compare. So the model with that predictor value variable and without that predictor variable. The wall test, on the other hand, is going to apply approximate the likelihood ratio test but that approximation only requires one model to estimate so instead of fitting two models you're only going to fit one so the wall test is going to be asymptotically equivalent to the likelihood ratio test so that means that as your sample size becomes infinitely large the values of your world statistics will be closer and closer to the likelihood ratio uh, test. So if you have large sample sizes, you should have the same conclusions for both tests. But if you have small sample sizes, using the likelihood ratio test would be recommended because you're going to do that actual comparison. Whilst the world is going to be an approximation, so you might not necessarily have the same conclusion. Another important thing is to interpret the coefficients. So you have there your logistic regression, you have the numbers, but how do you put those numbers into words? So going back to our example, we are interested in comparing the odds of surviving third degree burns for two groups so for example we want to compare uh, the patients that had an area of 1.9 with the patients that had an area of 2 so to do the odds ratio what we are gonna do is the uh, exponential of beta 0 that we calculated before times the difference of our groups here so it's 1.9 minus 2 because we want to understand uh, how does uh, the, uh, the odd of a patient with 1.9 compare to with this patient of 2? So we have here that is the exponential of 1.05 that it's equal to 2.86. So that means that the odds of survival for a patient with an area of 1.9 is 2.86 times higher then the odds of surviving for a patient with area of 2. So it's way more likely for you to survive if you have a smaller area, if you have this area of 1.9 compared to someone that has an area of 2. Uh, another thing that we can talk about of the coefficients is the relative risk. So the odds ratio is going to be constant for any value of x. You can try that. But it's not going to be, that is not true for the relative risk. 
why the relative risk is written as the probability of success of y divided by the probability of success of y, I'm sorry, probability of success of x divided by the probability of, su of success of x plus 1. So if we use our burn data here, this is the probability of survival, right? And so to calculate the relative risk, we can actually create a function. So I call that function pi burns. This is how you create a function in R. You say function, and then you give the arguments of your function. In my case, it's just going to be x here. So I open the brackets, the curly brackets, and I'm going to write my function here. So my function is, I'm just going to copy here, so it's the exponential of the, uh, of our, of our coefficient, of our first coefficient, that's how you get the value of your first coefficient, plus the uh, second coefficient, so beta 1, that is this, this is beta, exponential beta 0 plus beta 1x, right? So plus beta 1 times x divided by 1 plus the exponential of beta 0, that's our first estimate, that is this value here, plus beta 1 times x. We all know the values here, I could have written those values instead of calling the table that has them, but this is a more uh, reliable way of writing functions, because if I just put hard code the number, then if those numbers change, because I have another data, then that function won't be good for this other set of data. But by using this uh, the table, getting the column here, this is how I get a column with a dollar sign, and this way I'm saying I want the first value of my estimate column of the our ID table, this is the second column, uh, this is the second row of my estimates column. Uh, this way, don't matter the data set you have, as long as the table still remains uh, with the same name, you're going to get the proper values. So x here are going to change. Uh, I'm creating a sequence of 1 to 3 by half. Mutate is how you create another column. So I'm creating those values, and to create that column called values, I'm going to apply my function, but this map apply is the function that you use for data frames. So I'm just going to have another column as a appended to my original column, that is just a data frame that goes from 1 to 3 by half. And I'm going to mutate, so I'm going to add another column, that's going to be the actual relative risk, that is the values, divided by the previous value, the uh, the next value, because this is exactly what I'm doing, right? x over x plus 1, so this one and the next, divided by the next. So what we're doing here is just doing for 1 to 1 1.5, it's going to be 0 0.999 divided by 0 0.998, and this is almost a little bit more than 1. But when we see 1.5 to 2, it's already 1.2. From 2 to 2.5, the relative risk is 40. From 2.5 to 3, the relative risk is 189. So we can see that the relative risk is really not constant for any value of x, and it can change by a lot. Ending here is going to be NA because we don't have any other value post 3, so it ends on 3, so we don't have the next value to compare with, that's why it receives a not available uh, value. Uh, so we can also talk a little bit of the assumptions of the model. So when we fit a logistic regression, we should ask ourselves, did we meet all the assumptions to fit this kind of model? Because if we didn't, we shouldn't apply that model. It's not right to do that. So linear regression had its own assumptions. 
logistic regression also has an assumption that's going to be very similar to the ones in linear regression. And we need to make sure that those assumptions are met before accepting the logistic regression model as our final model. So we need to have independence of errors, linearity, absence of multiple linearity, and lack of strongly influential outliers. And how do we check assumptions and R? We can do that by plotting the logistic regression fit, and that plot is going to generate four different plots. Uh, we can see that the first one is the residual versus fitted, and that's going to help us understand if there is uh, if the errors are around zero, if they're so that's exactly what we want for them to be around zero. We don't want them to have any patterns. The second plot's going to be the normal QQ. That we're just going to say if our, uh, if our values have a normal distribution, which in our case doesn't really matter as it's the logistic regression, but that is a very important assumption for linear regression. The third chart is the scale location that's going to understand if the data is homocedastic or not. And, uh, and the fourth chart is the residual versus leverage that's going to help us understand if we have outliers by using the Cook distance. So just a more formalized uh, definition here are all the charts. So the residual versus fitted is going to help us understand if the residuals are distributed around zero, if they're random or not. The second chart, the normal QQ plot, to understand if the residuals are normally distributed, but if they are not in the logistic regression model, it's not a problem. The third chart, the scale location, help us understand homocedasticity, heterogeneity, and the logistic regression is heterosedastic by nature, so that's okay. And the fourth chart, that is the residual versus leverage, can understand that can help us understand if we have outliers in the data. So, so far, we fit the model, check for the coefficients, their significance, we check the assumptions of the model, it's all good. We can safely fit a logistic regression to the data and draw conclusions from it. But now, we want to actually predict what would happen if a new a patient would arrive in our data sets. What is their probability of surviving? So how do we predict? To predict, we're going to use the prediction function from base R. That function, so as it's from base, we don't need to install anything. And what we need to give are three main uh, arguments. First one's going to be the fitted model, so the logistic regression fits. The new data point, so the new patient that arrived, we need to know uh, their area. And the response type. As we're working with logistic regression, we use type as response, because that type is going to give me, it's going to give us the probability of belonging to the baseline category. Let's see how that actually works. So going back to our example, the third Burns uh, example, third degree Burns, I'm going to pretend here that I have two new patients, okay? And those two new patients, as the only variable we need to know to fit our logistic regression is the area, that it's called log area plus one midpoint, that's all we need to give for new data. So I'm just going to present I want to pretend that one of the patients has an area of 2.12 and the other one has a larger area, but not by much, just 2.22. So they're quite similar. And now we actually want to predict. And to predict, uh, you can see here that I'm using the pipe again. So I'm getting this new data here, that is the table, and I am applying something. I'm applying the function C binds. C binds represents column binds. So I'm just binding another column to a data frame, in this case, to this data, 
to this data frame of two rows and one column. So I'm expecting to have now two rows and two columns. And what I'm adding to this new column is what I'm going to call the probability to survive. And it's just the result of the predict, that is our, our function. I'm giving here the logistic regression fit, LR fit, the data, that is the new data, and the type response. So when we see the results, we can see here that we just added another column called prob, prob to survive. And we can see here the probability of surviving of the first patient is 0.52, so might have half either survives or not. But the second one, it has a probability of 0.27 of surviving to its burns. So even though the area is not so different, the probability of surviving is clearly very different. So this one here, it has only a 0.28 probability of survival. That's not much. And okay, so we predicted this. Uh, so we so now that we have our prediction, we have this probability. We can also define. Okay, but what does that actually mean, right? I have here a 0.52, a 0.27. How do I determine that person is going to survive or not? Because that's what we wanted in this part, right? We had that our function was survived. Sorry. By the area. And then how do I classify this probability? Because in the end, once you're using logistic regression, you usually want to classify something. You want to classify an outcome. And just by seeing the probability, you don't know the classification. So to classify something, we need to determine a cutoff point. So that means that we need to determine a threshold that we're going to define, okay, this is the class 1, so it means that you survived, right? Or class 0, it means that you died. So whenever we're thinking of a cutoff point, the default value, the most common used one, is 0.5, so 50%. So what we're saying is that if the probability that the model is going to give us is greater or equal to 0.5, then we classify this as a 1, as a success. So in our case, a survival. If the probability is less than 0.5, we classify that as a 0, so as a failure in our case, as a death. So by using that in our example, so we have this new data here that we generated, right? That is just the uh, the area with the probability of survive. And now we actually want to say if that new patient survived their burns or not. So I'm going to create a new column by using the mutate function, survived the burns, and it's going to receive an, uh, this function here, if else. This function is just an if else clause and so what you say here is for example what is the clause you want to test for so in our case the probability of survival is greater than 0.5 if that is true it's going to receive a 1 and if that is false it's going to receive a 0 so when we do that we have here that the first patient that had a probability of survival 0.52 it's actually a success, or survive the burns, or probably survive the burns. But the second individual that had a probability of survival just 0.28, it receives a classification zero. So only the first new patient will probably survive to its burns. So we created that classifications of ones and zeros. But now what we actually need to do is to assess the goodness of the model. So to assess the goodness of the model, when we had a linear regression, we would use the R2 metric, and that metric will help us understand if the, if the model was good or not. But in logistic regression, we don't have residuals. So if we don't have residuals, we don't have an R2 value. So how do we measure the goodness of our model? 
how do we discriminate between success and failures? Because what we want here is to have a model that's going to produce us with a high probability of success for the observations that are actually success. But we also want a low probability of success for the observations that were not successful. So what we want are what we call concordant pairs. And to do that, to measure these concordant pairs, we use what we call confusion matrix. The confusion matrix is like this. It looks like this. So we have here and the columns, the predict. Predict is what the model predicted. And in the rows, we have the actual, that is the reality, what actually happened. And then here we have negative and positive. So what the, uh, what the model product predicted as negative and as positive, so as zero and one. And the actual, what was actually zero and what was actually one. So what we have here is then we can look at the pairs here. We have negative with negative, that's good. If something is negative, so if something is a zero and we predict it as a zero, we predict it correctly. So we call that a true negative. So true negatives is actual and prediction as negative as a zero but it can also happen that in reality you're a negative you're a false but we predicted you as a positive so as a good thing as a success and that's what we call a false positive and it's also the type one error the other scenario we have in the confusion matrix is when the reality is positive, so the reality is good, it's a success, but we predict it as negative, which predict it as being a failure. And that's what we call the false negative type 2 error. And the other good thing is when you actu you're actually positive and we predict it to be positive. So that's actually a correct prediction. So that's what we call the true positive. And from this matrix, we can gather a few measures. We can identify a few measures. So the first one, uh, a very popular one, is called accuracy. Accuracy is what you predicted correctly divided by every, everything. So it's the true positives plus the true negatives divided by everything. So the true positives plus true negatives plus false negatives, false positives. Uh, you can also have what we call sensitivity. Sensitivity is also called recall or true positive rate. And it's the true positives divided by everything that is positive. So what is positive here is the true positive plus the false negative. As we have the true positive rate, we also have the false positive rate. That is the false positives divided by everything that is positive. That is uh, everything that is negative, actually, sorry. That is the true negatives plus the false positives. So here, true negatives, false positives divided by false positives plus true negatives. We also have this specificity that it's 1 minus the false positive rate. That is the true negative divided by the false positive plus the true negative. So it's just 1 minus this one. We also have the positive predicted value that is also called precision. And that is the true positive divided by true positive plus false positive. So when we are talking about precision... We're talking about actually how good we are predicting things, the positives of your model. And we have the negative predicted value that it's also about the prediction. So it's going to be the true negative divided by the true negative plus the false negative. And the false discovery rate that's going to be 1 minus the positive predicted value that is the 
false positives divided by false positives plus three positives. So if you love those metrics are about the actuals and other measures are about the predictions. Uh, so how do we assess our model? Now that we saw the confusion matrix, we can think about, okay, maybe half is not going to give us uh, the best cutoff point, or maybe it will. So if we use that cutoff of half, 0.5, we have that the accuracy is 0.82, the sensitivity is 0.68, and specificity is 0.88, because we have here the matrix. So what we did here, uh, we just added the uh, prediction to tell based on the result of the prediction, what is the classification. So if it's greater than 0.5, it's positive or otherwise it's negative, and caret, is a machine learning library in R, and this library you need to install it, and it has a function called confusion matrix. This confusion matrix you give as the first argument the data, the actual data, so people have survived, and the reference is gonna be the prediction value. And here we have the actual, here are the predicted, and we can see here, and based on the table, you can calculate uh, the values using the formulas here. So 0.82 accuracy, not bad, but the sensitivity is not so good. The specificity, on the other hand, is quite good as well. But what happens if we change the cutoff point? Because the cutoff point is just a baseline, and we can change. So for example, if we use a 0.25, our accuracy, our specificity, and our sensitivity are all above 80, 80%. So that's even better than when we were using half. So how do we choose the best cutoff point if it changes? Uh, what we can do is to use the library of cut point R. So you need to install that library, and the library provides a function called Cut point R, so it has the same name as the library itself, and that function requires a few arguments. So the first argument that you need to pass is the data set. So in our case, it's gonna be TD birds. We also need to pass an argument, the predictive variables. So we are using the area as the predictive variable. The outcome is the survived. Uh, then you, oh, you can also give some values here that are not uh, necessary. They have a default value as well. It's called the first one. It's called method. It's going to determine the cutoff points. So you can, uh, the default is going to be maximize metric. That's going to maximize the metric function. That in this case here, you, you can also give, but it also has a default value that is the sum of sensitivity and specificity. Uh, but you can change, but if you open the help of that function, you're going to see that you can uh, optimize by accuracy, by rocker, by a lot of different metrics. But this is the default one, that's what we're going to use. And you also need to define what the positive class is. So we're saying that the positive class is 1, but it could be 0 sometimes. So I'm just saying that it's 1. So here we're saying that positive class has lower x values. Uh, so when we see the result of CP, so we're calling here CP the function, when we see the summary of that, we can see that the best cutoff point give us this result here. It gives us a 0.81 of accuracy, a 0.86 of sensitivity, and a 0.72 of specificity. So you can just run that to give you the best cutoff point. So far, we've seen how to do a logistic regression using only one predictor variable. Most of the time when we're going to solve a, a problem, we're going to need to use more than one variable. And for that, we're going to use what is called multiple logistic regression. 
it follows the same process of a simple of a binary logistic regression but now we are gonna have more uh, independent variables to work with so uh, the function now the logistic regression is not just given by beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 now we're gonna have plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 plus beta n x n and uh, the probability of success now is given by the uh, exponential of this function here because now it becomes a function of x so uh, one very important thing to talk about before we actually go into the details is categorical variables so categorical variables are independent variables. They're gonna be, for example, race, sex, treatment group, things like that. So they are not gonna have an order associated to them. So we call them dummy variables as well. So one example would be a gender that is coded as female, male, and other. So we're going to have three levels for that variable, but we're going to need to dummify that variable. As there is no order, uh, dummify means that we're going to create columns for each of these levels. Actually, for C minus one levels, if we have C equal to three, for example, then we're going to have two columns only. So, for example, this data frame here that I generated, so we have here gender female, male and other, and then uh, so those are the roles. So to represent female, we're going to have then C minus one levels, it's going to be female, male columns. So if it's one here, it represents female, zero for the rest, because only this first observation here belongs to the female gender. If you have a male observation, then you're going to have a zero in the female column, a one in the male column. And if you have the other category, then you're going to have zero for both female and male, because zero in both columns means that it belongs to the other category. So that's always how we're going to dummify our categorical variables. Uh, the example we're going to work here now, we're going to shift around the third degree bond and we're going to work with the HERS example. So HERS is a data set that is from the heart and estrogen or progestin replacement study. And it's a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. And the idea is to test the efficacy and safety of the estrogen plus progestin therapy for prevention of recurrent coronary heart disease events in women. So all the participants are postmenopausal women and uh, they've received the tablet randomly assigned with the medicine that's going to have the uh, all this... Uh, hormones and the placebo is gonna be not receiving hormones so we have here the data uh, for these data sets we're this data set is huge but we're only going to use a few variables to work with so we're choosing medcont age weight diabetes and drink any Okay, so those are the variables we're going to use. To download this data set, we can use the real package. This real package allows us to read data from URL. So we don't need to first download the data and read the data set. We can do everything in R. So all you need to do is give the URL. Then we import using the import function from Rio, And all we need to give is the URL as a file argument and here I'm I'm saying that hers is going to receive just this data here and it's going to be the entire data set but we want to select just those uh, variables so select function is still a part of the Dippler uh, functionality so we can call this uh, select from Dippler 
and we just say the variables we want to use. So age, weight, diabetes, drink any, and met count. And we can see here that just the heads of the data that we have here, uh, diabetes and drink any, you can see it's yes and, uh, and no's, because we can see here the no's. So these are examples of categorical variables. Uh, age and weight are numerical variables, and the match count is going to be our outcome. So continue with our example using the HERS data. So we know that a multiple logistic regression, just like the, the examples before, is going to have a binary dependent variable, but we're going to have multiple independent variables, and that's the difference from the previous example. So we are going to apply a logistic regression to the data sets, and we're going to use the MedCon as the dependent variable. Age, weight are numerical variables, diabetes, drink, any are categorical variables, and they are also independent variables. So uh, we saw here that the drink, any, the drink, any, diabetes, and MedCon are categorical. Why match count is categorical if it's only zeros and ones? Because it has an actual definition, so the one is a success and the zero is the failure, for example, but uh, or in this case, the if you have a medical condition or not, so one would represent true and zero would represent false, and we want to predict, in our case, uh, if the person has a medical condition or not, based on the other four variables. So, even though it's a numerical variable, it still represents a factor because it's just true or false, it has a medical condition or not. So, what we need to do is uh, we need to actually apply the factor because R considers categorical variables as factors to the data or R won't know how to deal with that. So in here what we're going to do is we're going to use the mutate function from Dippler to change the type of the variables because those two are going to be strings probably and this one's going to be a numeric but that's not what we want. So we're going to use the S factor that it's from base R to these variables. So what we're saying is that diabetes now is going to be an S factor diabetes. Drink any is also going to be a factor and med count is also going to be a factor. One thing to note is that this data set contains NA values. So there are values that are missing and logistic regression doesn't deal very well with um, non-available data. So what, what I'm going to do is after applying this mutation of the uh, variables, I'm also going to omit the non-available data by using the na.omit function also from base R. And if you do a glimpse of the data, you're going to see that dataset has over 2000 rows, five columns, and you're also going to be able to see the types of the variables. And you will see that those three variables here, they are now considered factors. So now that we fixed the type of the variables, before we need to run the model, uh, before we run the model, we actually need to define the reference level. Because now as we have uh, more than one value, we need to say, okay, this is uh, this is what is going to be my baseline. This is what I'm comparing to. You. So we only have to the default NR is going to be uh, the alphabetical order if you have text, or is going to be uh, the ascending if you have numerical. So the reference would be zero as it is the smaller number, but if you want to change the reference to be one, so to be true instead of false, you could add here ref equals to one. But for now, we're gonna leave 
uh, zero as being the reference level. So as I'm leaving the default, I didn't need to do that, but I think it's important for you to know how to change the reference level if you need to. So if we check here that uh, the levels of metcont, we're going to see zero and one because the reference is always going to be the first value here that's going to show up. So now we're going to apply the logistic regression using the GLM function just like we did before. The only difference is that the function now is different because the function now it, it has here our outcome variable, metcont, and then what comes after the accent is all the variables we have. Before, we only had the area of the burn here, so it was a quite simple model, but now we have those five, those four variables actually as the independent variables. So the data is hers, the family is still binomial because we're still applying a logistic regression. And when we see the uh, result of the GLM function, we can see that we're going to have the intercept, age, weight. We're going to have a value for each of the, uh, the, the estimate for each of the variables. So, uh, and just like the univariate example that we had before, we need to test for the significance of the variables. And we're going to do that. Uh, we know that we can do by, uh, that by two methods, the Wald test and the likelihood ratio test. But we're going to use the Wald here, as we saw that we have over 2,000 observations. That is a lot of observations. And uh, so we can use that. And then it's going to be easier to get the values. So if we see here the, uh, the results of the GLM first, we can see here the call that you have the formula, that's what we wrote, the family and the data. And you can see, like I mentioned before, that we're going to have an estimate for each of the coefficients. So for each of those variables, we're going to have an, an, a hat, right? And so we have here age, weight, if you see diabetes, yes, and drink any, yes. Why is that? If we had yes is a no, because the diabetes now the reference level for both diabetes and drink any is the yes, and uh, so what he's saying is that when you have a, a yes or a one for diabetes, you're gonna multiply by that factor by that value is gonna be 0. 0.43 times one. When it's no, it's gonna be 0. 0.4 or three times zero because uh, we are in the no in the zero so this is what uh, this is how we interpret the coefficient now and uh, as we're gonna test for the significance of the coefficients we're still gonna do the same hypothesis as we did before so the no hypothesis is if beta is zero and the alternative hypothesis if beta is different than zero but now we are gonna have zero one two three uh, betas so and so the test is the same but we're gonna test four times and uh, we can so doing that, uh, we can see here the, the results of the HERS data set, tidy, very well tidy. We have here the estimates, we have the standard error, we have the statistics, and we have the p-value. And based on that, we can create the formula the, that we saw before with that gx. So it would be the intercept plus 0.018 times the h, so every change in the h, we're going to multiply by 0 0.018 plus 0 0.442 times the, dia the diabetes if yes, minus 0 0.25 times the drink any if yes. We can also notice that all the p-values are smaller than 5%, so we would keep all the variables in the model.
That's what we would call an addictive model because that model was just, we were just adding those variables, right? And the formula here is just age plus diabetes plus drink any, and that's it. But we could also have interactions between our variables. And what does that mean? Uh, we need to ask ourselves, how, to, how do I combine the information of the different explanatory variables that I have? Because the uh, interaction, it means that uh, the effect of one of the variables on the outcome might be different when I change the level of another variable. So, for example, uh, this, uh, when I change drink any, does that have an impact on uh, by how much I change the age as well? Maybe, I don't know. So, we need to maybe understand how the variables interact with each other. So, to do interaction, we use the star sign in the formula. So if we do, for example, medical condition uh, and the formula, the other side of the formula is gonna receive age, start of the times, drink any, we can see now that we have another row, one row for age, one from, for drink any, and another one for the interaction with a, of age and drink any. And that interaction can be seen as this uh, symbol here. We can see that whenever we see this symbol, it means that we are testing for the interaction as well. And when we add the interaction, the conclusions of the model might change. So we can, for example, estimate the odds ratio with interaction. So uh, we can use, for example, medical condition with drinking versus not drinking. So if we do here just the medical condition of drink any, we can hear, we can see here that the odds ratio it's 0.7, and all the variables are significant. But then we can have here the additive model with drink any plus diabetes, for example. So the odds ratio pretty similar, a little higher, but still pretty similar. And all the variables are also important for the most significant. And then we can add the interaction. So I'm going to do diabetes times drink any. And we can see that the when you now to calculate the odds ratio, we have to do the, the odds ratio from for when you have diabetes, odds ratio for when you don't have so to calculate the odds ratio for diabetes, we have here the drink any minus the interaction of diabetes with drink any, it's minus. And then that odds ratio is 0.69. But then with people that don't have diabetes, it would be just the drink any, if there's no diabetes involved. Then it would be just minus 237. Then we have here that uh, the odds ratio is 0.78. So there's a huge difference here between people that have diabetes, if they do have a medical condition or not. And then it might be sometimes that the interaction between the terms are not going to be significant. Then we can just, uh, we can remove but if the interaction is significant and the coefficients by themselves are not, then we need to keep them in the model. One thing to be cautious about is what we call multicollinearity. So when we talk about linear regression, one of the assumptions is that there is no collinearity between explanatory variables. Because if they are correlated, we might face uh, some problems like the parameters might be indeterminate, uh, the standard errors might become infinitely large, but multicollinearity is a common problem and we can test for that to make sure that 
we don't face uh, that problem whenever we are dealing with a problem. So we have a few ways to detect multicollinearity and for that we need to calculate the correlation between each pair of explanatory variables. If two variables are highly correlated, then that might be a source of multicollinearity. Uh, we can also use something called VIF, that means variance inflection, inflation factor, and it measures uh, the magnitude of the multicollinearity of the model terms. So, uh, to understand the correlation between each pair of variables, we can use a pairwise correlation. And that chart we can per, we can plot by using the library ggGalley. It's a complement of the ggplot, but you need to install it before using. So we call here library ggGalley, and we use the function ggPairs from it. So I'm using, and all you need to pass as an argument is the data you want to calculate the correlation from. So I'm using here. Hers, select diabetes, age, drink, any, and weight. Because I'm removing the outcome from this pairwise correlation. And then we can see here the chart. So if two variables are numeric, then we are actually going to have the correlation value. But if they're not, then we're going to have some charts. So for example, diabetes uh, with diabetes, and we're just going to see the number of yes and a number of no. Uh, but then here we have the uh, the plot that shows diabetes per age. So we can see here that age goes uh, until 80 here. This is people with diabetes, people without diabetes. But we can see that the age is pretty similar on this plot, box plot. Uh, then we have diabetes with drink any. And then again, this yes and no, and people that drink and people that don't drink. So uh, we can see here that people that drink, that drink is yes, and diabetes, yes, is the one that has the most uh, of the people here. Uh, and then uh, the correlation here between age and age and weight is negative. So you can see all the uh, pairwise blocks. But then it's going to be very subjective for you to look and say, oh, okay, there isn't a correlation or there is a correlation between my variables. So we might want to use something more uh, numerical to help us make that decision. And for that, we can use the library performance. So we need to install this library before using it. And this library has a function called check collinearity where we can use it by passing. So we have here the GLM and then we can say the performance check collinearity of this GLM here. That's going to be this, uh, this model that includes the interaction between diabetes and drink any. And that is our model. And if we run, if we see the result, it says that there is a low correlation between diabetes and drink any. So we can say that we probably don't have a multicollinearity between the terms of our model. Another thing that's very important is model simplification. So we create a model, especially now that we're dealing with a lot of independent variables. So we have a model, but we should always keep in mind that we need to use the simplest model that can help us with our problem. Because if you have too many variables, you're going to create a complex model. And complex model leads to overfitting. Overfitting means that your model cannot generalize data well. So we can't predict on unseen data. Uh, that means that you're pretty much going to fit a line between all your points. So you know very well what's happening at the present. You can say this is the function that maps everything. But if you have a new subject and you want to know if that subject has a medical condition or not, you won't be able to because 
you didn't learn anything. You can't generalize, so you can't predict. But two later variables also lead to another problem that's called underfitting. And that means that your model didn't learn enough about the patterns of your data. So it won't be able to tell you as well what's happening, what's going to happen with this new subject, because it couldn't even learn what's happening for the subjects that you have data for. And uh, whenever we're doing a model, then we might need to add or subtract variables from that model. And to do that, we can use two metrics. One of them is called a Kike's information theory, a criteria, sorry, AIC, and the other one's called Bayesian information criteria, that is the BIC. And both techniques are going to help us uh, remove add variables to our model are going to help us with this model simplification and we want to choose the model that has the smallest uh, AIC or the smallest BIC and we have three main ways of doing what we call this variable selection that is forward selection, backward selection and stepwise selection forward selection, we start with an empty model and we add the best available variable at each interaction. So we are always going to check if we need to transform something, if we need to add another variable or not. So we should also look at interactions that, we're gonna, that we suspect there could exist in our data. But looking at all possible interactions can be very tricky because if you have ten variables, you're gonna have the interaction between all those ten variables, and that is a lot of new uh, variables to look for. So your model can become more and more and more complex. But these steps of doing this forward selection is you start with the, the response variable that gives you the best uh, prediction, so the best predictor. Uh, then we apply the, the regression on it. We add the next best variable. We apply the regression. And we see, we compare the AICs, we compare the predictive values. And if the model got better, we leave that variable there. If the model got worse, we don't add any more variable. And then we keep doing that. Uh, the backward selection is different, it's the other way around for the forward selection. So you start with the full model, you start with every, all the variables and every possible interaction. So it's a gigantic model at the start. And then we calculate uh, their, uh, the AIC, the p-values, and we see what is the least significant variable. And then we remove the variable of the model. And then we run the model again. And then we remove the next uh, least significant variable. And we keep doing that until we have all variables significant in our model. So it's the other way around from the forward selection. And we have the stepwise. That is a combination of both backwards and forward selection. So we start with no predictions, no predictors, then we add the most important predictor just like the forward, but then after adding each new variable, we can remove variables that are no longer important for the model, just like the backward selection. So you can add something, mm, good, add another one, mm, good. Then if you add a third one and you see that the second one is no longer important, then you can remove that one. So that is a, a better model and so on. So how do I do those selections in R? So if we go back to our HERS example, we're going to do a backward selection here. So starting with everything and ending with a simpler model. Uh, we can use the function step AIC from mass package. So we need to install the mass package before using that function. And then we this function chooses the best model based on the AIC as it says 
on the function name. We can also add as one of the arguments the, the direction that you want uh, the selection to go. So we can do backward for backward selection, forward for forward selection, or both for the stepwise uh, selection. And that is considered to be the default value. Uh, the result of this function is going to be the best final model. Uh, we're going to use, as I mentioned, the backward selection. So we have here the full model. To fit the full model for the backwards, we need everything with every possible interaction. And you're not going to write age plus diabetes plus weight plus drink any plus age times diabetes plus age times weight plus age times drink any until you get to plus weight times drink any. That is just too much. And if you have a lot of variables, you're going to spend a long time just writing all the interactions. So what we can do in R is put everything in brackets and do this uh, squared. So, and that means that we're getting everything. All those variables and their interactions. Uh, then to do the backward uh, linear regression model, we're using here the step AIC uh, function. We're giving here this full model. The direct direction is backwards, and we don't want to give the the trace, or it's just gonna keep outputting uh, some text telling us uh, when it's doing things and where it is, because it can take some time. But I'm just gonna leave it false here, and if we see uh, the output, we have that this is the best model. So the best model includes age, diabetes, drink any and the interaction of age with diabetes. So weight is not important for the model, so it's not a part of our model. And then, once you define what is the best model for our uh, data set, we can actually predict. So if we have a new data set, a new observation, a new woman coming to this study, we can apply that model to this new data to see uh, if they would have a medical condition or not. So this new data here, I'm um, just uh, the age, I'm just running uh, a sample from 15 to 8, and I'm going to have three women, three women here, and it can be, re it can have replacement, so it can be 15, 15, 15, for example but it is going to be a random sample. Uh, the same for diabetes, the same for drink any, and the same for the medical condition. Uh, then we have here yes and no's, but that's how the sample is going to be. And then in here, of course, we are going to have replacement because we only have two values and we want three samples. So once we add, uh, and I'm setting the seat here, because if you run this example in your machine with the seat, we're going to have the exact same values here. So I'm just making sure that you can reproduce my example. So we can have here, once we apply the predict with the response type, because it's logistic regression, we have here the probabilities of having a medical condition. And uh, and then we can uh, add the, the at the category here, we can say we can use that cutoff point that we saw before to see what is the best cutoff point to determine if they have a medical condition or not. Or we could use the default value of half and say if it is above half, the person is a yes, so it's a one. If it's below half, it's a zero, then we'll say that this is zero, zero, one. So uh, this one, those two wouldn't have a, med a medical condition, whilst the third subject has a, a medical condition, for example. And that's how we would do a multiple logistic regression. We saw uh, how to do a logistic regression when we have a binary outcome, either if we have only one uh, independent variable or if you have multiple independent variables, we know how to deal with that. But what if our response, our outcome, has more than two results. So what if it has three classes, four classes? 
how do we work with that? Can we still use a logistic regression? Yes, and that is called multinomial logistic regression because you're going to have multiple outcome uh, possibilities now. And uh, so the multinomial logistic regression is going to be a generalization of the logistic regression when we have these multi-class problems. So when we have more than two possible outcomes. But the analysis is very similar to the binary logistic regression. For this example now, we're going to use another data set. It's going to be the breast tissue data from UCI. And our outcome is going to be the class column. Because that class is going to tell us uh, if it's cancer or not. And there are different types of uh, breast tissues in this data. So the first thing we need to do is download this data set. To download the data, we're going to first create a temp file uh, from this CSV. Why can't I use the real just like I used before? Because this one is in an XLS and real doesn't work with XLS that well. So I'm going to do this a little longer path instead of having to download and read the CSV or read the uh, Excel from my machine. So what we do is we create a temp file that's going to be a CSV. And we pass the URL of where the data is. That is this website here. And then we use this function download file from base R. And the arguments are going to be the URL, the dest file, that is this stamp file. But it could also be an actual file, uh, uh, an actual folder on your machine. And mode is WV because we want to actually write the data. So we are saving the file. And then we save the file, so now we need to read that file. So breast cancer is going to be the name of our data now. And we're going to use the readxl uh, library. So you need that library installed. And we're going to use the readxl function from that library. And for that, we give the, uh, the name of the file that is just called temp in our case. And going to be the second page of your Excel. So that's why I'm giving the page here, because this data, the first page is going to be uh, like a glossary of what is happening in your data, all the explanations of every variable. And we are going to remove the case number, as that is just an ID. And we don't need IDs when performing any uh, model. And then we're going to do a glimpse of our data just so we can see how the data look like. So we can see here that class is a character, so it's not a factor. And we have in this example, we can only see cars because it's going to be ordered by that. Then we have this I0 area, a lot of variables here that we don't know the meaning, but just for the sake of the example, we don't need to know the meaning of the variables. We just need to know the class, the outcome variable. So uh, we saw there as we, that class is not a factor, but it has to be a factor because it is the possible classes, the possible outcomes of our of our variable, of our variable of interest. So what we're going to do is first mutate that uh, variable to a factor, just like we did before with the drink any and medcont. So we see here we can use the s factor function in the class and now we change the type of the variable. But now we need to define the reference level or the reference level is going to be the first one that it's car. So we need to say, okay, what is the uh, reference level that I want? And I want this ID now to be the reference level. So we can see that ID is the first one or it would just be a uh, car would be the first one here. But we kind of moved it to the start of the queue, for example. So we have here, add is the first, that means that is the reference. So now we can fit the, uh, multi, the multinomial logistic regression. 
we can do that by using the nnet library. So we need to install that library before using the uh, function. And the function we are going to use is the multinom. So here we are importing li the library. And here we are using the multinom uh, function. And you fit uh, this multinomial logistic regression the same way you used to fit the binary one. So the first argument is the formula. So I'm using class. And I have a lot of variables. I'm not going to type the name of all of them. So what you can do is use this uh, dot. Dot represents everything. So I'm saying that uh, class is my outcome. And all the other variables are the uh, independent variables. If we wanted just specific ones, so then we would write, for example, GA plus area. But this way, we're getting everything without having to type all the, post all the names we have. The data is breast cancer. We don't want to trace as well because it can also take some time. And then we can see the summary of our uh, multinomial. So now we have here that in the coefficient, we have for each of the classes, their intercept and the values for the I0, PI500 for all the other variables we have. So we have here the intercept for each of the classes and their uh, combinations uh, with the other variables. And we also have the standard error. So just like we have for the coefficient, we're going to have the standard error for every coefficient and for every independent variable. So another thing we can do here, just like we did for the binary logistic regression, is to do the odds ratio. The odds ratio is the exp exponential of the coefficients. So all we need to do is to apply the exponential function on the coefficient functions, because that coef you're gonna that coef function you're gonna get the coefficients for uh, your multinomial regressions. So here we have the uh, odds ratios. We can also predict and validate the model just like we did before. So to validate the model, we can look, for example, at the accuracy. Uh, to do the accuracy, so we have here predict the data. Uh, the new data is going to be the breast cancer itself. So I'm just going to apply a prediction on the actual data set to see uh, how good the model is, for example, to predict known outcomes. And now uh, you can see that I'm not using response as type. I'm using class. It is using that default value of 0.5, but it is already giving me the class. So when we run this stable function, this stable function just going to do the sum of these. Uh, it's going to do the sum of everything. So it's going to do the sum of the actual value, that is the class, with the prediction. And it's going to give us a confusion matrix as output. So we have here that for the add class, class we got everything right. For the car, we got most of it right, but we got two values wrong. We said that something is car when it was actually gla and another one was actually mass. And we have other ones as well. So the con, all good. The fat, uh, we got most of it right, but we also got some mistakes. And then uh, this is our confusion matrix. We can get the exact same values as we would from the binary. So the, uh, to do the accuracy, for example, if that is how we are measuring how good our model is, we would do the sum of everything correct, and we would divide by the sum of all the numbers in our data. So every account, every row. We can do that by using the tab here that we are using in the classification as a matrix, as a confusion matrix table, by doing the sum of the diagonal on the table because the diagonal is what's correct. We want to sum that and we want to divide by the sum of everything. So just the sum of every value in this uh, table. And then I'm just rounding and we have that the accuracy is 82%. So 
to finish, we can talk about proportional odds model. There are models that's going to have also a multi-class, for example. But that uh, the outcome has an order associated to it. So it's not really a categorical variable. For example, when we think about uh, the Linkert uh, scale, so we have, I don't know, good, very good, excellent, bad, very bad. So we know that very bad is the worst one and very good is the best one. So there is an order to that outcome and we need to make sure that that order is respected. And for that, we use these uh, kinds of models, these proportional odds models. Uh, just to recap uh, a little bit, so the dependent variable is going to be ordinal now, not categorical. And the difference is that there is an order in the categories. Uh, so, for example, we have uh, someone giving asking you to give a score uh, for a place. If you recommend that place from 0 to 5, you know that the 5 is the most important one and so on. Uh, so both uh, multinomial and ordinal models are going to have more than two categories. But the difference is that the multinomial logistic regression has multiple nominal outcomes. So multiple categorical outcomes. There is no order behind female, male, other. Female is not better, male is not better. There is no order. But on the proportional odds model, we have multiple ordinal outcomes. So there is a clear order to the categories. Excellent, good, okay, bad. Uh, so just a recap on the definition of the of this model. So we have here that it's going to look at the class. So it's going to be a cumulative probability. Of, the, of y of your outcome being less or equal to a specific category. And we're going to have a very important assumption that is called the proportional odds assumption that the number added to each of these logarithms here of these, uh, to these cumulative probabilities is going to be uh, the same in every case. So we're going to use another data set for our example. This time we're going to use the NYANES uh, data set that stands for National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. That is a survey on health and nutrition for uh, adults and children in the United States. And that data includes um, in-person service, there's physical, physiological examinations, laboratory tests. There's a lot of variables in there. Uh, but we're going to select just a few of them to do this example. So we have the outcome variable that's going to be the health gen that represents the general health of that individual answering the survey. And it has five levels. Excellent. Very good. That's uh, B good. Good, fair, and poor. And we're going to use uh, sleep trouble, diabetes, age, gender, BMI, and phys active. That means that if you're physically active as the predictors. And we're also going to remove every NA value, as we spoke before, that linear uh, logistic regression doesn't deal very well with that. Uh, that data set is available on an R library. So we can just install this Yanis library and then call the library and get the data. So the data comes from this. Uh, it has the same name as the library. And then in here, we're just going to select the variables that we're interested in and then omit the non-available data. If we see here the head of the data, we have that sleep trouble diabetes, gender, 
physical active and health gen are already factors because when someone created a library they already uh, create the library in the proper way with all the proper types age and bmi are going to be our numerical variables where age is an int so it only has integers and bmi it's a double so you can have real numbers here so now we are going to fit the model. To fit the, no the model, we can use the pull R function from the math library that we mentioned before to do the step AIC uh, 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 function. And that this pull R function, it stands for uh, proportional logistic regression. And we need to specify as one of the arguments this has, that is the Hessian, uh, to be true. Because then the, the model is going to return also the optimization that was used and we can get the standard errors from that. So, when we, so to fit the model, we use the exact same arguments that we've been using so far. So the first one is going to be the formula. We have here health gen. I wrote the, all the variables because I don't have that many, but I could use a dot here and it would be the same. The data, the data set that we read, has the untrue. And then when we see the results, now we can have here that uh, we have all the coefficients for the variables, but you also have those variables here that are, they have this uh, dash uh, separating them, then we have so the excellent to very good, very good to good, good to fair, and fair to poor. And this symbol here is the level intercept. And that's how you, one of the indications that you have that you really use in this proportional logistic regression model. We can see here in the output that we have the, the variables of our model. There are estimates, so they're beta heads, they're standard errors and the statistics, but we don't have the p-value anymore. So what we can do is in, we can actually calculate the p-value. So how do we do that? We do that by uh, getting first the coefficients. So we can do the summary of our uh, fits and getting the coefficients, so the dollar sign, to get them as uh, data, so they are now a matrix. Uh, we can then calculate the p-value by using the formula of the p-value. So we have here the, the coefficients, we actually want the t-value one, that would be this one here. Uh, we want their absolute number, then we apply this probability uh, norm, so the, using the normal distribution and then we're just doing one minus that and multiplying by two because that is the formula of the uh, p-value and then we're just gonna see bind that to the coefficients so we can see that in the coefficients table we had the value the standard error and the t-value and now we're just calculating the p-value associated to it and we can see that they are all very small so they're all significant uh, we can also calculate the odds ratio. As we saw before, the odds ratio is going to be the exponential of the coefficients. But uh, we already have the coefficients here in this table that we just created. So I'm just going to transform that to a data frame so I can apply a mutate and select because those variable, those functions only work with data frames or tables. Uh, we apply them. Uh, so we are applying the data frame function to that matrix. Then we apply a mutate, so we're going to create another column that's going to be the odds ratio, that is the exponential of the coefficient, that it's represented by the value column. And then I'm just going to select the value, the p-value and the odds ratio for a display, because we don't really need the standard error and the t-value here, I'm talking about odds rate ratio. Uh, so we can interpret uh, a field of the coefficients uh, assuming that all the other coefficients are held still 
we have the having trouble sleep that is represented by sleep trouble yes so you do have trouble to sleep it's gonna be associated with an approximately 85 percent higher odds of worse general health uh you also have the diabetes so having diabetes is is associated with an approximately 3.05 times the odds of worse general health. You also have the being physical active has approximately 40% lower odds of worse general health. So being physically active is good. It's and we know that already, so that makes uh, sense from what we have in this common knowledge. We can also do the model diagnostics. So the model diagnostics would be the goodness of fit. So we have a particular way of doing that or no logistic regression. And for that, we're going to need to use the general host lamp package and R. It's a very big name. We need to install that package before using the functions that they have. And there are two functions that are recommended to use with this kind of models. That is the Lipsitz test and the Polk-Rob chi-square. Uh, we're going to use the Lipsitz test and it only needs uh, an easier format of the data. And here we're going to need the vector of the categorical uh, input variables. Uh, so we have the, the no, it's still a, a hypothesis test and the no hypothesis is a good model fit. And if you have a low p value, we are gonna, uh, we're gonna, uh, it means that we have problem with a model. So we can run here, uh, both tests even. So in here I'm running the first one and then I'm appending and binding the rows with the second test, but see, I need to pass the categorical variable as an argument as well, or you won't understand. And if we see the results, we can see here that we have very low uh, p values. So both of the tests tell us that applying this logistic, this original logistic regression is not good to our data. Well, we're gonna keep uh, doing uh, the analysis here using this model just for an example. So we also need to check for assumptions. That assumption that I made, that I mentioned at the start, that uh, so we need to check the assumption of proportional odds, and we can do that by comparing the proportional odds with a multinomial model. So what we need to do is. Uh, we can use the function uh, LR test from the LM test library. So we need to install that LM test library before using the function. And it's going to compare to for us the polynomial regression with a multinomial one. For that, we also need to uh, run a multinomial test. So we can do that by either use the NNet library, like we saw before, or using the GLM the same way, uh, family binomial. And for the function LR, LR test, we need to pass both the, the proportional odds and this uh, multinomial mod, model. And then we can see here the p values associated and the degrees of freedom, everything. And this p value here, small right, zero. So that tells us that the model doesn't fit uh, this logistic uh, proportional odds model, it doesn't fit the data as well as the multinomial logit uh, model. So ideally, we would stop uh, the proportional odds here and we would use the uh, multinomial model to answer this problem. And uh, that's it. Uh, if you want to continue with the proportional odds, to do the prediction would be this exact same way as we've seen before. You use the prediction function, the predict function on unseen data, and then you can run uh, the confusion matrix and see how good your model is. And that's how you would perform uh, 
these are sort of algorithms. Uh, this is all we had to discuss, and I hope you've enjoyed. Thank you for listening. Thank you.